Welcome, welcome Grace Church, and uh, welcome to all you online uh, who are tuning in. Uh, I don't know if tuning in is the right way to go about saying that, but I'm old, so that's okay. Um, we're just glad you guys are all here. Um, I would just want to say this, this building, right, this building's not a church. Um, so all you people out there online, all you people who are here, you're, you're the church. Um, it's not the building. And so um, we're, we're glad for everybody. We're glad for God's presence. We're glad you're all here. And um, we just want to stand up for a while if you guys are able to, uh, whoever's able, and worship along with our wonderful praise team. And I want to do a quick shout out to my daughter, uh, Maya, who turns 13 today. So happy birthday, Maya. We love you.
that song. I love how it talks about trusting in you because I feel like right now we've got a lot of pain going on in the world. And uh, it's something I've been learning recently that every pain that we go through is an opportunity that God has given us to put our faith in him and to trust in him to help us through that. You know, people say that God doesn't give you more than you can handle, but he gives us stuff that we can't handle on our own because we need to put our faith in him. So I encourage everyone to uh, worship along with us as we go into this next song.
holy, holy, holy. That is the truth about our God. The holiest. Um, we can't even get close to his presence and without that sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what we believe as Christians. And, um, you know, right now in these times, uh, challenging, different, difficult times, times that can seem to separate you from God, uh, times that could like, push God away from you or feel like God's not listening, not there for you. He is. He's always there for you. And he loved you so much that he, that he gave his only son for you. And if you're out there, um, you're hurting, you feel like uh, the world's forgotten about you, you feel like you're alone, Jesus is the one that can uh, bring you peace. And he's the only one that can bring you peace, and that's the only truth. And all of us, every single one of us in our lives, we have that one choice to make. It's so like the Bible says, even, even the demons believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in Jesus. And um, they know he's true, but for whatever reason, um, they've chosen to go against him. Don't choose that path. Um, come toward the light. Come to Jesus, and he will bring you peace. Um, I just want to pray uh, for our, our pastor today. Uh, pastor Rob, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but his sister had uh, passed earlier this week and after a long illness. Um, and uh, I know he's hurting. I know he's grieving. Um, and, and the Bible tells us to do that, to take time to mourn. Um, but I also know that in his heart of hearts, there are seeds of joy. And I know, Lord, I know you've placed them there, um, and you've placed them in all of us as Christians. That we as Christians, we don't, uh, we don't succumb to death. Uh, we know that Jesus freed us from that. Jesus uh, and his sacrifice freed us from the power of death. And so we have nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of. Lord, we just ask that you would be with Rob this weekend, uh, be with his family. Um, just put your, your, your peace that, that comes without f us fully understanding it, peace that just goes beyond all understanding. Cover him with that. Um, allow him to mourn in the way that you want, but also let those seeds of joy um, start to grow in his heart that we know that uh, his sister's life was so valuable and that, that she is now in the presence of Jesus. And for that, we thank you so much. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. All right. Well, welcome. Um, again, we're glad you're all here. We're glad you're here with us online as well. Um, if you need prayer, you know, if you are hurting, if you're, if you're feeling lonely, you need somebody to reach out to, um, we have uh, prayer at trygrace.com. Um, and we also, there's a trygrace.com slash connect. Uh, that just always feels weird to say those kinds of things, but that's the world we're living in now, an online type world and COVID world, and a lot of us can't get around and, and move freely anymore. So, um, but if you do need any, any help, um, please go to those, um, and that can give you a little bit of comfort. Um, just want to announce we're going to have uh, the Impact Kids Church and Nursery will resume on November 1st. Um, so that's exciting, right? You're like, sweet. Um, and also, we got a 12 1 scavenger hunt this Friday, I believe. Is that correct? This Friday, uh, 6 to 8 30. Is that correct? I think so. Hopefully, they'll have it up there. On, is that right? Yeah. Um, and I want to announce, too, we're going to have a men's uh, group meeting at the end of October here, October 30th. It's a Friday evening. Just some barbecue. Uh, Kelly Day and I are going to make some barbecue. I think we're going to order some, some sides, uh, some good food. We're going to play some cornhole. We'll get some stuff set up in here and just uh, have a little bit of fellowship with, with the men. So that's uh, Friday, October 30th, 6 to 8. And then we've got, uh, Kathy's got a wonderful message here for us. Um, you know, it's a little s s spontaneity with that, right? I don't think she was planning on, on doing Sounds that. Good. But she is... Uh, if you've never heard her before, uh, she's fantastic. If you have heard her, you know that I'm, I speak the truth. Uh, 
So I'm going to... It only costs 20 bucks to get him to say something like that, I'll tell you. But, uh, I can say anything for 20 bucks. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So glad to have you here this morning. It's rainy. Mm. I want to talk to you this morning about something I think that we all struggle with from time to time, and that's doubt. Um, has if, anybody ever faced any doubts before? I mean, look around. You're in good company. I've got some myself. There's one thing that I am absolutely certain of. I kill plants. I kill, I kill all plants. God has given me many, many talents. He has given me many abilities. Horticulture is definitely not amongst them. Um, Mark told me probably six months into our marriage, just give up and get the ones you dust because I kill them all. I have killed, you know, pothos, the stuff they plant like at the TGI Friday that grows like weeds that nobody ever tends to. I've killed that. I've killed ivy. If you put kudzu in a pot, I could take care of that too. I'll, I'll kill that. Um, for real, I've killed succulents. They thrive on neglect, and I kill those. So um, I always kind of cringe a little bit on the inside when somebody gives me a plant. Sorry about that one that you gave me, Billy. That one, I tried. I cringe a little bit when people give me a plant because I, I know it's very thoughtful, and I love the idea of having them, but I know how that story ends, and I know that I'm going to kill it. And I don't mean to. I've had a few orchids over the years, and I love them. They're so pretty, and everybody says, they're so easy to take care of. Lies. They're not. Uh, we, all, we had one that rebloomed. It rebloomed many times, and that was the but ugliest flower I have ever seen in my life. I, I, it, Mark got it from the uh, grocery store floral department, and they gave it to him because the guy there thought it was dead. And doggone if that thing didn't start blooming, and it was scrawny and orange, and it looked like some weird alien thing. I don't know. So I tried to, like, Google and find, you know, I Googled with weird orchids to find a picture of that variety to show you. Wow, you want something to do this afternoon, Google weird orchids, because there's a lot of weird orchids. And I didn't, never, did found, I never did find the little weird ugly little weird alien thing, but um, that's uh, proof right there that God has a sense of humor, by the way, if you take a look at those orchids. But I eventually killed that one too. And a year ago on Mother's Day, so that's been like a year and a half, um, Emily, my daughter, gave me an orchid and it was beautiful and it was all bloomed out and pretty and not an alien. And that was nice. And, and inwardly I cringed because I knew the fate that awaited that unsuspecting beauty. But I put it on the ledge in my office, and I was determined to try and take care of it. And it was beautiful for, for weeks. And then, as happens, the blooms dry up and fall off. And, and, but I continued to water it. Now, I, I really don't know how to take care of plants, and I don't know how to take care of orchids, but I know they need careful, intentional, and regular attention. And, and I've done that now even through like abandoning my office for a while. I have still cared for that, for that orchid. And for over a year, it sat there doing nothing. And one day I came into my office and there were buds on that orchid. And I squealed like a little girl. And Juliet came running because she thought I'd probably seen something in there. But there were buds that it was gonna bloom again. And I was so excited. And, and so I sent pictures to Emily. And I think she was probably just as amazed as I was that I hadn't killed it. And, uh, and every day, you know, like the buds got a little bit bigger. And then one day I came in and there was one bud, open, there was one bloom. Send her a picture, there's a bloom. And then the next day there was another one. And there were like nine blooms on this thing. Every day there was a new one and it was fabulous. I know they need the right amount of water and sunlight and fertilizer, but I neglect them. And then I try to make up for neglect by overwatering, not a recipe for success, gardening by fits and starts. That, that's not, that doesn't work. What the plants need is regular attention, careful, intentional, regular attention, not fits and starts. And our faith is the same way. Um, our faith, uh, for our faith to grow and to thrive, it needs careful, 
intentional, regular attention. It needs to be nurtured, and it takes time. And see, all that careful attention that I gave that orchid uh, paid off. It took a long time of watering it every day, or not every day. No, don't do that. That kills them. Water them once a week, water them for over a year after the blooms dropped with no sign that anything at all was happening until the buds came. And then within a week, it was in glorious full bloom. You know, if we, if we graphed the action of that plant, it would have been a flat line and then a big spike. And that happens in our faith too. So like our faith isn't always this, you know, progression, you know, we spent time with God, we read our Bible, we prayed, we went to church. Look at that, up we go. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't always follow that trajectory. Sometimes we can be stalled right there. But something is going to burst forth at just the right time. You know, Ro Paul tells us in Romans that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. So, you know, if we want to grow our faith, we've got to be in the word. We've got to be in church. We've got to listen to church online. We've got we to get in the word. But when I was watering my orchid and seeing nothing happening, I started to doubt it would bloom again because my track record does rather speak for itself. And doubt is a very powerful thing. And it's one of the enemy's most used weapons uh, to undermine our faith because it works. You know, and he'll plant a little seed of doubt and we'll take care of that one. In Genesis chapter 3, we find Eve wandering happily about the garden in her birthday suit, admiring all the beautiful flowers, no dead blooms on any of them. And uh, the serpent slithers up, not even a, hey, how you doing? He slithers up and says, did God really say? He, he just jumps right into the doubt game. He, n no pleasantries, no small talk. Did God really say? And that's how the whole mess started, that little seed of doubt. Genesis 3.1, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God really say? Are you sure that's what God said? How do you think he said that? Was it like incredulously? Did God really say you can't eat from all these trees? Was he mockingly? I don't know. But not only that, not only that did God really say, he distorted what God said. Because the serpent says, did God really say you can't eat from any of these trees? And God didn't say any tree. He said, he said that tree. He didn't say any of these trees. Because if we look back in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The enemy is crafty. And he knew what God said. He's messing with Eve's head. He's planting that seed of doubt. And it worked. It worked then and it works now. And now we don't, we don't know exactly what was happening in Eve's head here, but, but she got it wrong. In Genesis 3, 2 and 3, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the tree, the fruit of any of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Well, God didn't say she couldn't touch it. See, she starts getting it wrong. So that little doubt got planted in there. He just said you can't eat from it, but she's getting befuddled and confused here. And she knew what the serpent said was wrong, but she didn't seem to catch that what she said was wrong too. And then in Genesis uh, 3, 4, and 5, here the enemy swoops in for the kill. Oh, you will not certainly die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Hmm. Well, that might be the tempting part, maybe not actually that fruit. Well, God did say they would die, but God was talking about a spiritual death. And the serpent distorted the meaning. You know, you're not going to just, it's not like you're going to drop dead right here. Come on. Eat that fruit. Looks good. God knew where their disobedience was going to lead, and the serpent distorted the meaning. You're not going to die. 
In essence, the enemy calls God a liar. It's causing her to doubt God. God did say, you will certainly die. The serpent said, you will not certainly die. So one of them is lying. It's not God. Paul tells us uh, about the enemy's nature in Romans 8, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That just rolls out easier for him than the truth. Doubt can be our undoing, and doubt can completely undermine and strip us of our faith. Doubt, to doubt God's word, is the first step on that slippery slope toward our own destruction. Because without the foundation of the word, that anchor for our souls, then we're adrift. We, we have no uh, foundation, we have no basis, we have no standard to compare things to, no truth. And if we aren't careful and intentional and regularly tending our faith, the doubt creeps in. And when we are doubting God's word, then we start to doubt God. When we doubt God, we start to look for something else, which is going to be something lesser to be our standard. Maybe we decide to rely on ourselves. You know, I'm the captain of my own ship. I make my own destiny. I'm the boss of me. Have you ever let yourself down? Everybody, we're going to go around the room and share how you've let yourself down. Yeah. Has anybody in here uh, ever kept every single New Year's resolution? Have you ever said something and immediately gone, mm, oh, I shouldn't have said that? You let your own self down all the time, right? So anything less than God is going to let us down, even our own selves. So if you, if you decide that you can't count on God, and you know you can't count on yourself, who are you going to count on? So when we doubt God's word, we begin to doubt God. Have you ever had somebody in your life that lied to you? Not, not the three-year-old with the chocolate on her face. No, mommy, I didn't eat that cookie. Not that one. Like a grown person in your face telling you a lie that you know is a lie. Mm. You, you doubt them then, right? The next time they tell you something, you doubt them. If you tell me something that I doubt is true, I'm naturally going to doubt pretty much anything else you say. If I'm not confident that you're truthful with me, then I'm not going to be able to rely on you. I'm not going to believe that you're going to do what you say you're going to do because you've lied before, right? And I think that's even more the case with God. If we're doubting that God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do, then when we don't see him do, when, when I don't see you move the mountains that I need you to move, when I don't see God doing that, then it's real easy to doubt him because I can't see him and touch him right here. Because we don't always understand what he's doing. And so it's real easy for the enemy to plant those seeds of doubt to get us to start doubting God's word and start doubting that God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he's going to do. So let me ask you, does it make you a bad Christian or make you not a Christian for you to have doubt? Can you believe God? and doubt at the same time? Is doubt the opposite of faith? See, I think the Bible is full of terrifically flawed people, and many of them doubted God, but they still believed. So I want to look at some of those. You know, there are people that, that doubted Jesus even when they saw miracles happen. The Israelites doubted God even when, even after going through the Red Sea and there's a pillar of smoke and fire and there's manna falling from heaven and their shoes don't wear out. Like, I can't get about, like, two or three seasons out of a pair of sneakers and then we're going to another one, right? Forty years their shoes didn't wear out and then they're going to doubt God. But not all doubt is bad because actually a lot of people have come to faith in God and put their faith in Jesus because they doubted. They doubted their worldview they doubted what they had been taught growing up. They doubted what that, uh, that preacher said or that mama said. And they decided to seek some truth. And God said, if you seek me, you will find me. So God's not really afraid of your doubts. He's kind of okay with that. Doubt can wreck our faith, but it can lead us 
to a stronger faith. Now, if you, if you believe the Bible, I believe the Bible. If you believe the Bible is the word of God, then you've got to believe all of it and not just the parts that make us feel good, right? So when we start talking about things like, you know, demonic spirits and, and the enemy and the Bible, those things are in the Bible. And so if you want to take all the good, you know, Jesus loves you, this I know for the Bible tells me. So if you want to take that part, you've got to take this uncomfortable, weird stuff, too, about there being evil spirits because it's in the Bible, so we can't pick and choose that. In Mark chapter 9, a man brought his son to Jesus because the son was possessed by an evil spirit. There is a very real enemy out there. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, Peter warns us, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around, prowls around like a roaring lion. Oh, there's a lot of L's in there. Prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. There is a very real enemy. So the man brings this possessed boy to Jesus, and he's desperate for his help, and he's at his wit's end. If you've ever had a, a sick child, desperately sick child, you, you know that, that um, helplessness that you feel. He's probably tried everything there was to try. He's probably exhausted all of the potions and the, you know, whatever options were available he comes to Jesus and he pleads for help. So this is in Mark chapter 9, verse 17 to 23. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son who's possessed by a spirit that's robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes, it, it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. You can almost imagine he's desperate right here, his, his child's whole life. It's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And then I just kind of imagine Jesus, if you can, <laughs> if, everything is possible for one who believes. See, doubt has started to undermine that father's faith. He's probably put his faith in an awful lot of solutions and cures before this, only to be let down. In Jesus, he has hope. He's surely heard of the miracles Jesus has done. And the disciples had done. Why else would he be there, right? But the disciples couldn't heal the boy. So the doubt starts chipping away. And, he, and then he slips in that big old if on Jesus. If you can do anything, of course I can, says Jesus. Everything's possible. 924, it says, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Have you ever felt that? I do believe. Help my unbelief. I really do believe. I really want to believe, but I'm struggling with the doubt. When that doubt creeps in and the enemy starts whispering lies to us, he convinces us that our doubt means we don't believe, and that's not true. We can believe and still have doubt. God is a pretty big concept. He does some amazing things that defy logic and physics and medicine. He does miracles that we can't explain with science. We've seen some of them right here. You remember David Copperfield? He made the Statue of Liberty disappear once. Did anybody see that? Did I dream it? Nobody saw that? Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> he made the Statue of Liberty disappear one time. And I saw a show about this years ago. They had this platform set up that they put the audience out into the water out in the New York Harbor. They're all seated on this big platform with all these crazy lights and stuff. And then way out there, there's the Statue of Liberty. And they've got this big ring of lights around the base in the water, shining up. But it's, I don't know, I'm no 
20 miles, 10 feet. I don't know. I'm bad judge with distance, but it was, it was kind of way far out there. So he does this, um, he does his little hocus pocus thing, you know, the lights drop. It's, it's dark. It's moonless night. The lights drop to black on the statue. And then there's all these pyrotechnics and, you know, the, hey, I'm an illusionist. Look over here. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain, right? He's doing all of his little hocus pocus stuff over here, getting everybody's attention. And then suddenly the lights come back on. No statue. It was pretty remarkable. So I'm looking at that empty space and I'm thinking, I know he didn't actually do that, but but it's not there. I saw a, a, a thing on how he did that. He didn't actually make it disappear. It was just a, an illusion. He's an illusionist, right? So it was very clever. Because he took advantage of the darkness, the platform that he had all these people on was actually uh, motorized. And when they dropped the lights on the statue, while he's doing all of his uh, little dramatics and light show, that platform just turned a couple of degrees. And since the statue was so far out, there's another ring of lights right over here. The turn was so subtle, just a little distortion in the orientation, that the people on the platform didn't notice, because all the crazy stuff happening on the platform, they didn't notice that the shoreline had just turned just, just, just that little tiny bit. And here they are looking at the empty ring of lights. Ta-da! Made it disappear. It was pretty clever. And the people on the platform were turning so slowly and so imperceptibly that they didn't, they didn't register because he was commanding their attention. So um, they start doubting, <laughs> like I did when I watched it. Like, I doubt the man can make the statue disappear. However, I believe there's no statue right there. It's, it's kind of like a conflict of belief. That's kind of what doubts are. It's, it's not the opposite of belief. Doubt is the conflicting beliefs. Because I don't think anybody really thought he made a statue disappear. If they do, I sell him a bridge. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus sends the disciples out ahead of him in the boat because he went up on the mountainside to pray. And shortly before dawn, this is Matthew 14, 25 to 31, shortly, shortly before dawn, Jesus sent, wa uh, went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost. Well, of course it's a ghost. because People don't walk on the water, right? It's a ghost, they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if that's you. Here's a great one about doubt. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. So Peter, then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately reached, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter got out of the boat and walked on water. Can you imagine what that must have been look like? What that must have been like to look down and see the water like lapping at his toes? What did it feel like? You know, did he feel pressure under his feet like you do on the ground, or, or you know that? But where he knows he should sink because he's gotten out of a boat before, he's on top of the water. There are Peter's conflicting beliefs. Now he starts looking at the wind, he starts looking at the waves, his circumstances overwhelm him, but it's conflicting beliefs. He believed he could walk on water because Jesus said, come, and I think there's an awful lot of power when Jesus says something. And so he got out of the boat and he walked on the water. But then his belief that I can't walk on water, that conflicting belief created the doubt, and that's why he sank. In Matthew 21, 21, Jesus is walking with his disciples and he comes on a, up on a fig tree with no figs. It was all leafed out, so it should have had figs on it. But when he found no fruit, he cursed the tree and, and it withered and died and the disciples were amazed. And they asked how that happened. So in Matthew 21, 21, Jesus replied, I tell, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, both, 
Not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea and it will be done. If you have faith and do not doubt. Those aren't opposites. Those are two things. You can have faith and still doubt. You just can't let the doubt overtake your faith. After Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to his disciples. Have you ever read something like a number of times in the Bible and then you read it again and go, what? That happened when I read this one. Matthew 28, 16 and 17. Then the 11 disciples, this is, this is the 11. These are some of the names we know, right? This is the 11. They went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. This is right after he had been resurrected. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some of the 11. Some of the 11 doubted the risen Jesus. They knew he was dead. And now they know he's standing here. Those two beliefs were conflicting. Now we got doubt. Because how, how, that doesn't happen, right? That doesn't happen. Jesus could have reprimanded them right here and said, you know, like, is coming back from the dead not enough for you? Like, didn't I tell you I was gonna? He, he didn't. Instead, he looked at the 11 square in the eye and he gave them the great commission. While they're doubting, he gave them the great commission. He didn't say, take a little time. When it's settled, I got a little something for you to do. The next verse, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You know, he didn't say, look, you guys are useless. I got to go find somebody else because I'm never going to get through your thick skulls. He knew they had doubts and that they were trying to reconcile those conflicting beliefs. They believed Jesus was back because they could see it with their own eyes, but they had never known anyone to come back from the dead on their own they saw Jesus bring some people back. They saw Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth. But nobody stood outside of Jesus' tomb and said, Jesus, get up. They, nobody ever did that before. He brought him all, his own self back from the dead. That's just, that's, that's a little overwhelming. And he knew it was going to take them some time. And sure enough, the 11 took the message far and wide, facing persecution and exile and uh, all but John martyred him for the faith in the risen Jesus. So if you have some doubts, sometimes you're in good company and God will still use you. James 1, 6 says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. If you have doubts and you let those doubts overcome your faith, you've got no foundation. Believe and do not doubt. That's good advice, and it's easier said than done sometimes because the enemy will always sow the seeds of doubt, but we don't have to water them. Faith is a, a journey and not a destination. It's, a, it's an aspect of our relationship with God. And no one has, uh, no one's on that same place with that journey as you. It, faith is dynamic. It's living, it's a living thing that needs to be nurtured. And it grows when it's properly tended, when we're spending time in the word, when we're serving, when we're being around people who encourage us in our faith. And it withers when we neglect it or it gets choked out by the weeds of doubt. And when it comes to faith, you need to acknowledge your doubts. Go to God with your doubts. He knows anyway. He's not really threatened by them. Talk to someone you trust to give you some wise counsel about how to deal with your doubts. Don't pretend they aren't there because they are like weeds in the garden and you need to take care of them before they spread. Doubt doesn't mean you have no faith. It just may be an opportunity to grow your faith. The disciples doubted when they saw Jesus, but then their faith grew by leaps and bounds. One more little thing I want to show you. 
of my orchid. And as I was writing this message, just Thursday, I noticed there are new buds on this one. I'm kind of excited about that. Unexpected. I doubted that thing would ever survive, and now it's blooming. It's going to bloom a second bloom at the same time. Almost like God was saying to me, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Let's take communion, if you'll get your communion ready. You know, um, Jesus knew that the disciples were going to doubt, that they were going to have some doubts. He knew that that was going to take them some time to reconcile all of that. He knew they were still going to fall short. He knew their faith had a lot of growing to do. But he broke bread with them anyway before he went to the cross. And he shared the cup with them anyway. He knew they were a work in progress. And he didn't hold their doubts against them. And he doesn't hold yours against you either. That night, he took the bread and he broke it. And he shared it with the disciples. And he said, take and eat this. This is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood that's poured out for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you know our hearts, you know our anxious thoughts, and you know, God, when we're struggling with doubt. God, help us not to doubt your word and not to doubt you. Let our default be to doubt our doubt. God, I thank you that you promise that if we seek you, we will find you. And I pray that anyone in this room or anyone that hears this message, if they are struggling with doubt, if they're struggling with the doubt that you are who you say you are, God, that you would reveal yourself to them in a powerful way. God, that you would bring people alongside of them that would help encourage them in their faith. God, give us your strength and give us a fresh breath of your character so that we can believe and not doubt. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Kathy. Um, great words of wisdom there. Um, I always think about when uh, Peter was sinking, you know, and it was like all that stuff going on around him, and Jesus reached out to him, and I think that's an important thing to remember, too, with that, is that, uh, Jesus did reach out, and Peter focused back on him, and it kept him above the water. And uh, so, you know, just like you said, um, get back into the Word. You know, if you're having doubt, if you believe me, I, I s struggle with this. There's times where I'm, like, um, questioning things, but it's like I, it's usually when I'm outside of the Word, um, fall back into that Word, and it is, um, it is powerful. So remember that. Um, please again remember Rob, uh, our pastor, in your in your prayers uh, this week. I know we've got some other people in our congregation that are that are hurting, that are having some physical uh, issues. I'm not going to go into every, but keep them in your in your hearts and prayers as well. Um, and uh, we've got uh, remember the trygrace.com, um, trygrace.com slash connect as well uh, if you need any prayer and uh, again we just thank you so much for being here and we thank all the people that were online with us too today um, have a great week